the biggest unmet need of people with Parkinson's is their engagement, understanding and involvement with the condition. So the first thing I'm asking for is a paradigm shift in attitude and language and culture. Now, that's not a bad effort in the first minute of this talk. But we must make patient involvement the rule, not the exception. So much of illness is about mindset. People with Parkinson's attending this meeting don't just live with their condition. They positively defy it. But the journey to being able to thrive with Parkinson's is not an easy one. And to create some sort of framework around which to base this talk, this next slide shows how the journey is broken down into psychological zones, each of which has its own distinct unmet needs. The first stage on the journey is, of course, the diagnosis, after which it is common to go through the emotional triumvirate of shock, anger and denial, which is the next stage in the pyramid, from despair to fulfilment. This stage is, I think, one that everyone goes through. In fact, I would say that many people with Parkinson's do not actually get beyond this, this stage. The shock, anger, denial stage, the, the sad, sad stage, is one where we are incredibly introspective. What are the unmet needs of people who have just been diagnosed? And I think this is an area that is all too frequently overlooked. Of course, your primary wish is that the diagnosis is incorrect. And unfor unfortunately, sometimes it is. The first unmet need, therefore, is accuracy of diagnosis. But also when you receive a diagnosis of Parkinson's, you want it to be delivered in a sympathetic manner. And I've heard some pretty shocking stories of some brutal, shall we say, somewhat clinical diagnostic behaviour from neurologists, none of whom, of course, will be in this room. And finally, at this stage, you also want to know where to find constructive information about the condition you have, because you can rest assured that once the diagnosis is given, the recipient will not remember another word that was said during the remainder of that consultation. Moving onwards to shock, anger, denial stage. You're beginning to get a bit slower in your first years of Parkinson's, but there are new unmet needs that need to be dealt with. Firstly, there is nothing more irritating or disconcerting having been diagnosed by some eminent professor of neurology only in your follow-up appointment to be seen by the hospital kitchen lady. The relationship between con consultant and patient forms the bedrock of how you as a person deal with the illness. You need to be able to communicate and get on with your Parkinson's consultant and it makes a huge difference if you can see the same person each time you attend the clinic even if it is the hospital kitchen lady. The next obvious and much talked about need for people in the early stages of Parkinson's is access to a multidisciplinary team. Parkinson's is a whole body condition and needs to be treated as such. Access to other healthcare professions may be as important as having access to a neurologist. Within the multidisciplinary team, everyone should really have access to emotional support Remember, this is, I think, psychologically the worst stage of the illness. And to have some support and encouragement can make a world of difference in moving further up the pyramid. The next stage is communication. And this is a key moment in the transition from misery to rebuilding a new life. Slowly but surely, you begin to tell people close to you about how you feel you begin to realise that perhaps subconsciously that the only reason people don't understand what you're going through is because you have not communicated it to them. And you start to understand that communication is actually quite a good therapy. And also at this stage, you, the scientists, are always looking for drug-naive patients for trials. But if you want us to participate in these, then we have to know about them and understand what they mean. The communication phase is usually around about the time your neurologist first tells you it will be five years to a cure. Something he or she will, will continue to say to you for the next 15 years. The specific unmet needs in this stage are based mainly around information and understanding a bit more about your Parkinson's. It's a time at which the first seeds of hope start to germinate and you crave time and good solid interaction with your healthcare professional. 
Acceptance is another key moment. You begin to accept Parkinson's as being part of who you are. You are no longer the person you once were, and you accept your life has changed irretrievably. You start to alter your ambitions for the future and tailor them so that, so that, so that they take Parkinson's into account. And you're adapting to the new you and, and beginning to concentrate on, on the positives of this. You are now more concerned with things that you can still do rather than the things that Parkinson's has interfered with. And by the time you reach the stage of acceptance of your condition, you could easily be well into the on-off symptoms connected with the peaks and troughs of your levodopa intake. Your symptoms and side effects of the drugs you are taking are becoming more bothersome. And you want to go back to how you were a few years ago when your medication managed your symptoms more effectively. And sometimes at this stage, a complete medication review is necessary. This ensures that the regime is personalised to you and that you are not just following a generic Parkinson's procedure as described in some of the more inflexible neurological textbooks. And also at this stage, you are, at last, becoming, becoming accustomed to having the condition. And this new positive outlook needs to be nurtured and encouraged. The next stage is participation. And this is the stage where Parkinson's becomes a wider issue than simply you as an individual. You start talking to other people, comparing stories, listening to their experiences. You begin to look beyond your own personal fate and realise that your experiences might actually help others. The participation stage can be quite a dodgy stage as it depends what you're participating in. If you are gambling, punding, or indulging in wild, unabashed hedonism, then you probably need to pay a visit to Dr Ray Chowdhury, who is the next speaker and will hopefully be able to sort out these and, and other non-motor symptoms you may be experiencing. But hopefully your participation is connected with more constructive matters. Perhaps these relate to Parkinson's itself. And this is an interesting stage because I think it's a time in which your place in society changes and you're transformed from someone who was once more needy to someone who is now more needed. This is a stage when peer-to-peer -peer relationships become important and you could easily become connected with one particular Parkinson's organisation. These organisations need to be receptive and yet at the same time they should not tread on eggshells with any harebrained schemes you might be trying to introduce to them around this time. You are now actively in the business of trying both for yourself and others, like you to realise a better quality of life with Parkinson's. That could entail having access to complementary therapies, or perhaps trying out new technology which, which measures elements of your Parkinson's symptoms over time, and from which you can assess certain patterns of your own illness. By the time you reach Honanyar stage three, you're becoming pretty disabled, and yet you are still managing to enjoy life through Parkinson's advocacy. At this stage, I think, you're really looking for more effective ways for delivery of L-DOPA, and suddenly the treatments for more advanced Parkinson's become options for you. The unmet needs at this stage, though, are surprisingly more related to an ability to access the wider Parkinson's community and to become an accepted figure within it. By the time you finally become influential, your disability is unfortunately affecting your ability to exert that influence. Having said that, you will be heavily involved with pharmaceutical companies, patient organisations, or advising on scientific-led projects, or a, big, or a big conference like the World Parkinson Congress. Ultimately, the unmet needs of this and the next slide are that you retain your, your, your independence, your dignity, and the ability to communicate. If you can manage this at such an advanced stage of the condition, and you can still be fulfilled and at the same time really empower other patients like you to show the scientists and other members of the PD community that people with Parkinson's can make a difference. We damn well will make a difference in working towards better therapies which have the potential to stop, slow or reverse this, this condition. And then you reach the advocacy stage. Now you're really moving. You're becoming known as a face in the Parkinson's community, 
People are listening to what you have to say and are grateful for your input. You're becoming busy in the business of Parkinson's and this gives you quite a buzz. Influence. You and your colleagues are part of a group that is actually making a difference in the world of Parkinson's. Your input, passion, urgency, focus, fundraising, empathy and participation are, are having a direct influence on the future treatment and care of people with Parkinson's. And finally, at the top of the pyramid, we have the ultimate goal, a cure. And this is something that people with Parkinson's don't just want. We believe we can actually contribute to this and assist you in finding new breakthroughs in Parkinson's. I think by the time you, you are at the top of this pyramid, the unmet needs of a person with Parkinson's mirror those of the scientists in this room. We are looking for translational research leading to clinical trials of disease-modifying therapies. And these trials need to be smart trials which stratify patient cohort, cohorts, which have more effective outcome measures and which allow a quicker development pathway. This next slide focuses on an issue which I don't think is talked about enough and it really provides the framework for, thera for therapeutic unmet needs for patients. And this is the issue around risk and benefit. I accept that this is a particularly sensitive area to discuss but I always think it's absurd how little control we as human beings have over the most important aspect of our lives, our health. Who makes the risk to benefit calculations for us? And why do these not change throughout the course of an illness, like Parkinson's? Parkinson's may not be a death sentence, but it is a life sentence. And as, and as such, the risks you are willing to take in trying out new therapies are far greater the longer you've had Parkinson's. This graph just illustrates that point. And I think there should be more conversations about how risks of prospective disease-modifying therapies could be shared between principal stakeholders, the company, the clinician and the patient. Herein lies another unmet need of people with Parkinson's. And finally, before I sum up with what can only be termed as a quite magnificent final slide, I have one last request on behalf of all people with Parkinson's. The, the request is for neurologists and neuroscientists to be a bit more upbeat about the status of current Parkinson's research. The reality is that progress in Parkinson's research is in the best fettle it's ever been. So please, please, please communicate that hope with those who are within your, who are within your charge. And similarly, why must you all be so disparaging about research conducted by others? Publications which present potentially positive solutions to treating people with Parkinson's should, should be embraced first and critically analysed and not torn to pieces by default. Let's have some can-do attitude out there. The world of Parkinson's is an exciting place to be at the moment, even if you've had it for 20 years, like me. I'm sure that most of the, of the people with Parkinson's in this room will agree that our sense of urgency is intense. Our motivation for being here is fuelled by hope. And it is through this that the patients can become sufficiently educated, sufficiently empowered, sufficiently determined and sufficiently resourced to become an indispensable and constructive force for progress in pursuit of a cure for Parkinson's. And, and so to my final slide, which is a rather clever acronym, which, which, which really just goes to show that from the perspective of many of the patients that are here, this meeting. Our unmet needs are the same as those of you, the neuroscientists. And in fact, neuroscientist is the acronym that I use in this final slide. So here's my acronym, neuroscientist. And what are the unmet needs? Firstly, investment. We need investment to conduct the novel science. Next, we need clinical trials. We need outcome measures which are continuous, relevant. We need symptom modifying trials and therapies. We must have stratification of patients in trials. We need non-motor symptoms management. We need information sources. And of course we need encouragement, engagement and education. We also need support, whether it be emotional, peer-to-peer, or support networks. 
And of course, finally, above all else, we need teamwork. But what are we left with? Those three, four letters. There it is. The cure. Thank you very much. <laughs>